The Unshackled Waves, episode 24. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms here for this week's review episode. Uh, I'm, I'll start this episode by saying that it finally happened this week. Donald Trump is now President of the United States. This was despite the, the best efforts both before and after the election by the left and uh, elements of the right as well, uh, the media and celebrities to, to thwart the will of the people at every opportunity. But of course, they, they couldn't let his inauguration go by peacefully. On Inauguration Day, the left engaged in uh, violent protests in Washington, assaulting Trump supporters and destroying private property. The next day, there was a so-called uh, Women's March, which happened around the world, including here in Australia. The Unshackled team visited the one in Sydney and have released a series of video reports about what went on, so make sure you check those out. Uh, the first few days of uh, Trump's presidency have gone very well by scrapping key globalist initiatives. Uh, the rest of his cabinet still needs to be confirmed, which we hope the, the Senate will respect his choices. Uh, back here in Australia, we had the tragedy in Melbourne where a man who'd been released on bail the, the previous week for theft and assault uh, ran down people walk, walking along Burke Street, killing five people at present and injuring uh, over a dozen more. We still don't know if there is a connection to Islamism, as the police and our governments are now in the habit of always denying any events such as this is related to terrorism. So we as the alternative media have to investigate any new leads. Then on Wednesday, we had seven youth uh, detainees escape from the uh, Malesbury Youth Justice Centre in Victoria, going on a 24-hour crime spree. Uh, assault, uh, assaulting uh, members of the public and uh, conducting several carjackings before they were eventually uh, recaptured. Uh, these two events, they uh, they pretty much exposed the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews' soft on crime approach. Uh, other events that happened here in Australia is New South Wales got a new Premier in Gladys Berejiklian and of course it was the Australia Day on the 26th of 26th of January, which most of us enjoyed, except for the left, who, of course, had their usual tantrum. So to discuss this week's events, I'm joined once again by our New Zealand correspondent, Daniel Gross. Welcome back to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. So we'll start with the the Burke Street uh, car uh, car attack, which happened uh, uh, today is uh, Saturday the 28th, so it was... uh, uh, eight days ago, and it was a it was a pretty shocking. Um, uh, Cause I li- uh, I live in the outer, outer suburbs of Melbourne, but I go travel to Melbourne quite regularly. Uh, Burke Street is is sort of the main shopping area of Melbourne, so it was pretty shocking that this mm-hmm. uh, event event could happen. But even more shocking, the fact that. Uh, no one violent offender was was out was out on bail the previous week, uh, even though he had a history of criminal behaviour. And the fact that he was able to like the police had been pursuing him for hours beforehand, and yet let him go yeah. all the way into the busy CBD. It was just it, it was just unbelievable. Yep, and not only that, but the the police also stood down. It's not just that the the police knew about him. They, they, he had been with them hours before. He'd just been, he'd been on bail, and um, and then when this happened, the police stood down. Um, this is um, from ABC News uh, in Australia. Police defend memo on taking time to intercept stolen cars in Burke Street tragedy, where the Victoria Police had a memo to stand down while he was doing this. I mean, I don't think this was a mistake. I mean, this is probably one of the biggest things. Is it's not actually a mistake, right? The police did this, I wouldn't say intentionally, but they didn't do anything to stop it, right? They didn't do anything to protect the people. And it just shows what happens when um, the left get in control of the, uh, of the policing is that they let crimes happen um, because the, the, the rights of the criminals are worth more than the rights of the victims. 
It was pointed out to uh, out to me by a friend that if the if the police had uh, ended up shooting this uh, 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 the perpetrator before he uh, did this attack, then probably we'd be hearing about oh police brutality that you know they shot uh, a, a brown person and we would have had oh, black yeah. li black lives matter. So uh, you know they were, they were probably afraid of 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 that happening if they if they had taken action. Well, I mean, let's. I mean, this is the price of political correctness, right? These five people have died because of political correctness. Where someone who's stolen a car starts going on a rampage. If the police had shot him then, right? Then sure, everyone would have complained, but those five people would have been alive. So all the people that complain about political correctness and you know all that type of stuff, you know, you go you go to the five families of the people that have died, and you go visit the thirty people in hospital. And you go tell them that the political correctness, right? And give them a lecture about political correctness. Don't do it to us, right? Stop mollycoddling the, the, the perpetrators and start, you know, caring about the victims is sort of my, my sort of response to it. Yeah, and of course, after what do you the... Think? Yeah, after, after the the tragedy, of course, we had the yeah Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews, you know, with his virtue signalling, saying, "Oh, this is, you know, our hearts go out to them." And then he went and, uh, you know, put some flowers uh, at the at the memorial. Well, you know, doing all this virtue signalling, you know, is one thing, but actually, uh, you know, making sure that you know because this this event shouldn't happen in Melbourne. It, should, it shouldn't have been allowed to happen. And so, he, you know, he's got to make sure that yeah, this doesn't happen again. And uh, even though he's, he, he takes a soft on pro, um, crime, politically correct approach to uh, po policing, he was forced into action uh, on the Monday by announcing uh, an inquiry into Victoria's bail laws and also uh, stripping away the power of bail, uh, bail justices uh, to, to grant bail and giving it to after-hours magistrates, which uh, I'm not sure if it will make that, that, that big a difference, but uh, you know, he's a, he, the political pressure has at least got to him that you know, he's going to do something. Yeah, and hopefully, I mean, eventually what will happen is if it gets too far out of control, then people will just uh, have, yeah, people will get sick of it. The problem is how many people are going to have to die before that happens, right? We don't want, the problem is we don't want more and more people to have to die before those sort of policies are put into place. And of course, we don't know if there's an Islamic uh, element to the the attack because we, we were told by the police and the premier afterwards, oh, this has nothing to do with terrorism. There are no links to uh, is Islamic uh, terrorist organisations. But uh, pr but pretty much like people had to. Uh, Ordinary people had to go and inve investigate you know, this perpetrator himself. They found his Facebook page where he had posted uh, things, uh, uh, things sympathetic to uh, Islam and uh, Islamism. Uh, uh, the reason that uh, people don't uh, don't believe uh, uh, our governments and the police over over this claim that oh it had nothing to do with terrorism is because we had the attack on the Australian Christian lobby uh, just just before Christmas uh, where a, a man drove a, a van full of gas cylinders into the offices of the Australian Christian lobby and we were told the attack was not politically motivated and we haven't heard anything about why the person did it ever since. So this is why people are suspicious because we weren't told that uh, we weren't told anything about that so why should we believe the authorities here? Yeah, and this is the guy who, a week before he went on this rampage, he uh, knifed his brother, he stabbed his brother for being gay. And he said, he, Jimmy keeps saying, this is from um, the Metro, Jimmy keeps saying to me, I'm going to kill all gays and poofters and lesbians. Right? So, why the police are letting someone who has already stabbed a gay person, his brother, for being gay, and said, I'm going to go kill all the gays, and then they let them out, right? You, you either have progressivism and care about gay people, and you lock people up who stab gay people and say they're going to go kill gay people, or you don't, right? But you can't say that you care about gay people and allow someone like this to, to roam free 
or you, and like the the left can't hold the stick in both ends, right? You either have to care about the gay people, in which the people like this need to be locked up, and who cares about political correctness, or you you don't care about gay people, and you let people who say they want to go kill all the gays, all the lesbians, all the pufters, and from it's his words, and kill and stabbed one of them, his own brother, and then goes on a rampage in the car, right? This is what happens when you know sort of political correctness goes too far is you don't have no mechanism to uh, to protect the citizens or the most vulnerable citizens from you know these type of maniacs but we should also point out that this politically correct uh, approach it stems from the fact that uh, you know people pe uh, people commit crimes or well uh, people of color commit crimes because you know we're so racist and horrible as a society so it's our fault that you know they're criminals there's no there's no sense of self self responsibility so the way to uh, reduce crime uh, this is in the uh, uh, minds of the politically correct is that uh, we just need to be nicer to these people we need to spend you know more government money on on welfare and uh, education and it'll, and, uh, and it'll, it'll all be right we, we, which is you know it completely re removes any sense of self responsibility from criminals yeah, and what does that say about the um, about the people they're bringing in, right? That's that's the most racist thing you can actually say, which is the people committing crime are not actually responsible for committing crime, right? They have no personal responsibility. Like, the, if someone is a minority, then they cannot hold, have responsibility for their actions, right? That is the most racist thing you can do, right? It's it's only the um, it's only once that's pointed out that people realize that the left are the actual racists, right? They're the actual bigots, where they they don't believe that um, you know people of other ethnicities other than white can be responsible for anything negative that happens to them or anything that they negative that they impose on other people, right? And I mean that that will end one way or another, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mental illness, it's a mental disorder, honestly, the people that think like that. Yeah, uh, that, it's the, it's, as it's called, it's the racism of low, low expectations. But of course, uh, mm. to, to cap off the, the horror week in Victoria, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, there was a riot at the Melsbury Youth uh, Justice Centre on on this past Wednesday, where seven uh, youth detainees escaped, and they they went on a 24-hour crime spree involving carjackings, assaults, before they were eventually uh, recaptured. And this is not the first riot that's happened at a at a youth deten a detention centre in Victoria. There was one at Parkville a couple of months ago, uh, which caused mil caused millions of dollars worth of uh, of damage. Uh, and they'll move to the adult prison, but then all these bleeding heart lefty lawyers who, who oh, all, all these legal aid services, they're funded by the government themselves, uh, put in a uh, appeal to the court saying it's a violation of these, you know, young people's human rights, and eventually they were they were moved back. So pretty much, uh, the the soft on crime approach. It's not just uh, in the community, but it's also uh, in the in the jails as well. So we we had this uh, not just this right, but uh, you know criminals on the loose who were in stolen cars, uh, and you know. Uh, I saw the you know the people who were assaulted being interviewed. They were they were all petrified over over what happened, and it ju it just shows that you know, it's all it's all starting for uh, the far far left socialist premier Daniel Andrews. It's all it's all unraveling, and now I think you know people are really starting to uh, you know be outraged and and say you know what what the hell are you doing to our state? You know we we're not feeling safe anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, the only thing that will ever keep people safe is, I mean, you can never rely on the government to protect you, right? The government feeds, or the government power feeds on you not being able to protect yourself and them protecting you, right? And that's why every single time these type of things will happen is the government will take more and more power, right? That's why they allow it to happen. That's why the stand downs occur is because every time something like this happens, the government will never devolve power to the people. It will always use negative events to acquire more power. That's that's honestly why I believe the left does act in the sort of pseudo-tolerance way and they sort of say that they're for tolerance and this type of stuff because 
when you have that, all you do is you perpetuate or you create an environment where these crimes occur, and then that, um, when that happens, people will cry for something to happen, and then the government will always take more power as a result of it, right? They'll never, I talk about David Leinhol, right? The, the, the people will never give um, the citizens more access to weaponry or more access to, to guns to protect themselves, even if they're trained, even if they've done all the safety methods to, to as a method of dealing with these type of crimes. They'll always take more power to the cops and more, more power away from the citizens to the government. They'll never do it the other way around. And that's why the left is so, so much about tolerance, because they know that they'll never have to give the citizens any power, which will remove the power from the government. And you think about it, if, with, the, um, with, the, uh, with the escapees and this psycho in the car, if you had a, you know, one or two people that had guns, I mean, none of these problems would have occurred, right? If one, one, uh, one or two good citizens had, a, had you know, a couple of uh, concealed carries, just like it happens in America all the time, right? And, you know, uh, in Alabama, there was um, a, a famous case where a guy was in a truck about to go run over a whole bunch of people. And, um, and the guy just shot him three times and nothing happened, right? The same thing will happen in Israel. As soon as they, everyone saw the truck side to run, you remember the thing in Israel where the truck side to run people over? It were the, like 20 machine guns just shot the guy, right? So is, the whole thing is that if people were really serious about wanting to protect the citizens, they would allow the citizens to protect themselves because the police can't be everywhere. And the only way the police can be everywhere is if you institute a police state, right? Yeah, uh, g going back to, you mentioned uh, David Leinhelm, he put out a tweet after the, the tragedy saying, uh, calling the, the car a semi-automatic car, which, which was trying to make the point that, uh, you know, uh, uh, mass, mass attacks, they can be carried out by, by cars, not, uh, not just guns, and saying, you know, are we going, uh, making the point, are we going to ban uh, cars? And he was, uh, you know, pilloried for, for that tweet, which arguably... You know, did did sort of come out. Uh, the tweet came out as the tragedy was unfolding, so it was ill timed. But I certainly understand the the point that that he, uh, that he was trying to make. That you know, uh, people who want to kill will will kill with uh, whatever weapon they they can get their hands on. But yeah, in Victoria, mm -hmm. the the their self defence laws. They're pretty much you're not allowed to have any sort of. A weapon or object for for self defence in Victoria, we have the the Apex uh, Criminal Gang, which is uh, conducting carjackings, uh, home invasions, and 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 people, uh, you know, they're they're powerless. Like the. They're, they're, they're not allowed a gun, obviously, but even yeah. you're not allowed to keep uh, a baseball bat for for yeah, self-defense. Self yeah. you're, you're allowed to yeah. have a have a, have, have a ba uh, baseball bat if you're if you're playing baseball with it, uh, but to have it just for self-defense, that's that's uh, that's illegal. So it's yeah, basically the citizens are just you know ba basically praying that they're not they're not going to be attacked. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, only psychos could do something like that, right? Where you let criminals on the loose, you put them in an environment where they can do whatever they want, right? And then the people that they're going to attack and prey on, you sort of tie their hands behind their back and say, you're not allowed to defend yourself, you're not allowed any weapons to defend yourself, and the criminal is allowed to roam free, right? Only, like, that's sort of the, the mindset of the people in charge that would allow these type of laws to happen. I mean, it's totally psychotic and what's interesting is people got more upset at um david's tweet than the actual incident itself it seemed to me like right? they were getting more upset that he would make the comparison than the fact that some guy just oh, ran yes, over he, he, you know he, 30 he, something yeah, people uh, he, basically, he basically ran over the people himself himself that's what everyone because because of course it's it's not it's it's not the uh, so solution that you put forward that uh, is important. It's your virtue signaling that that's the main thing. So yeah, now, exactly. You know, ups exactly. upset and how your heart goes out. You know, that's that, that, that's what's most important. Yeah, and to to the last point, right? People will, will just now because it will be so so negative to the, the left wing press. People will, will downplay it because it goes against the narrative, right? It goes against the political correctness, it goes against the, you know, the, the, the softness on crime, it goes against, if it turns out to be a Muslim, right? 
who turns out to be a Muslim. It goes against all that type, all that lies, all those lies. And so that's why the downplaying will start to happen very quickly. The same thing that happened in Europe, right? I mean, every, in Europe, massive terror attacks happen all the time now, and some of them we don't even hear about anymore. Right? And so the same thing will happen in Australia, it would be my prediction on this. In a couple of weeks, you won't hear much about it. Yeah, the, the police and our governments, they've, uh, they, they don't want to acknowledge that uh, any of the, oh, the re, uh, of the attacks that we've had over the past year are related to uh, Islamic terrorism. We'll move on to our next yeah. topic now. And on Monday, uh, New, uh, New South Wales uh, had a new Premier sworn in after Mike Baird's resignation the previous week, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, who was the the deputy liberal leader uh, and treasurer is now the premier and there was a big deal made that she was the the first female liberal party premier and so uh, everyone was like oh you know this is a, this is a huge huge mile, milestone uh, but but of course you know it's uh, i don't uh, uh, I don't think you know she should be judged on her performance and uh, based on uh, her p political affiliations. I don't think she'll make a very good premier. I mean, she's uh, taking over an unpopular uh, government, which uh, introduced uh, some very severe nanny state uh, measures. She's from the far left of the Liberal Party, supports same-sex marriage, abortion, uh, multiculturalism, and in and open immigration. So she's going to further alienate the conservative base of the Liberal Party, and I think further fuel uh, the desire for a new Conservative Party. Yeah, and I mean, I don't know that much about her, so, um, but from what, what I've read, she seems to be sort of like what the new right, what the old right-wing parties have become, which is just left-wing parties in the right colours, right? The left have just infiltrated all the left-wing parties and they're all discredited, so now they've sort of moved into the right-wing party. It's the same thing that's happened in New Zealand, right? where they come into the right-wing parties, and now the right-wing parties just become left-wing, and you're going to have to make a new one, right? Um, but yeah, hopefully she does she does some good stuff, but I, I wouldn't hold my hopes, right? I wouldn't hold my hopes up. I wouldn't hold my breath for this woman to do anything positive for, uh, for New South Wales. Well, the New South Wales Liberal Party, our, our Australian listeners will, uh, will, will probably know this, but it's pretty much controlled by the, the far-left faction uh, of the party. I mean, all of the the, the left-wing hacks in the in the Liberal Party are getting pre-selected in in New South Wales. Mike Baird, even though he was conservative on social issues, was from the from, uh, from the left left of the party. Uh, uh, there's pre-selections are decided by uh, f uh, factional chiefs, and even her ascension to the premiership was a was a factional deal uh, stitched up about six months ago. In the event that Mike Baird retired, uh, both power brokers uh, from the, the left and the right agreed that uh, she would be the premier as long as the deputy was was from the right. So there was no contest in the party room. It was it, it, she put it, she was the only uh, uh, contender, and so it was pretty much uh, just a. Uh, complete when when the party room meeting happened on Monday. So uh, mm -hmm. it's her ascension has definitely fueled the uh, or the the perception that the the New South Wales Liberal Party is is rigged and undemocratic. Yeah, and it will continue like that until we get a new right wing party. I mean, the old right will just either will either have to re co opt it or they'll start a new party. It'll be one of the two. <laughs> Well, I, still, yeah. I, I certainly don't think that, uh, I mean, there's, of course, you know, there's a, 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 when the left say that, oh, it's great that, you know, we've, we've got uh, uh, this person as the head of a, a head of a right wing party, you know, you know they're not going to be very good. Yeah, yeah, their, their endorsement is sort of like, uh, sort of like a poison chalice, right? As soon as you, they endorse someone, you know something bad's about to happen, right? So like if a sour and endorses someone, you you don't support them, right? <laughs> yeah. So we might move on to a few days ago. It was uh, Australia Day, which is Australia's national yep. day. It celebrates when the first fleet came in came into Sydney in seventeen eighty eight. 
Uh, so it's mm -hmm. a public holiday here. Uh, most ordinary Australians have an Australia Day uh, barbecue. There's uh, festivals in in the major cities, but of course uh, the left uh, they can't they can't let uh, a, a national day go by uh, or a day celebrating Western civilization. So they they term Australia Day Invasion Day because it's apparently uh, the beginning of the genocide of uh, Indigenous Australians. So in our major cities, they held uh, Invasion Day rally. And and they also call for the the date to be changed, so they want a more inc inclusive day. And some of the the protest oh, the protest in Sydney actually turned violent with with one person arrested, who turned out to be a Greens uh, vol uh, volunteer or campaign uh, worker. Uh, so, and, but they pretty much got their wish with the the news bulletins all that night uh, t uh, discussing uh, oh, whether whether the debate should be changed, uh, which is, they, they are pretty much a vocal minority because there was a poll that was released that said only 15% of Australians wanted the date changed. But it just shows how the left can, it, you know, they've still got the ability to to ruin what is, you know, a popular and a, a day which most Australians celebrate. Yeah, and there will, and there'll be no appeasing them, right? This is what we're the right have just figured out with Trump, right? It's the um, there is no appeasing the left. If you change it to May eighth, right, which is what they, I think that they they wanted to change it to May the eighth, right? So in the middle of winter, where it's raining and freezing, that's when they wanted to have it. But let's say you did that, then and you, you know, everyone was proud on that day, then they would find a, a reason for that to be for that to be terrible, right? It's not about the actual day. It's not about the date. It's not about what happened. It's about the. It's about power and it's about control. The reason why they want to change it to to May the eighth is because uh, that is the anniversary date of the nineteen sixty seven Australian referendum, which recognised uh, Aboriginals as Australian citizens. So that so, so if we changed it to that day, that would pretty much communicate that. Australia didn't really become a country until 1967, which of course is not the case. And I mean, you think about all the problems in the Aboriginal community. Do you think the Australia Day being on January the 26th is the biggest problem facing the, the Aboriginal community? I would say the fact that, you know, the drug, the, the you know, the, all the drugs, all the crime, the fact that the, the high school graduation rate for Aboriginals is, I think, the lowest in the world. I think they've got the highest rate of uh, infant rape, right? I think the issues facing the Aboriginal community, um, being being Australia Day on the 26th of January, would be probably the millionth on the list that that should be solved before that. Which shows, which to anyone watching, shows quite vividly that the left actually don't care about Aboriginals, right? They're just using them for political means, because if they cared about them, they'd talk about those issues far before anything like Australia Day, any type of any type of sort of virtual signal reasons, right? They would say, you know, all these problems, the huge, massive underlying problems within the um, Aboriginal community, they'd focus on those before they focused on the date of Australia Day, right? And I think if you solve those problems, then the date of Australia Day really would matter, right? And it just shows, I mean, for me, that's the most telling thing is there's such massive problems in the Aboriginal community. The fact that they would focus on this and, and use the Aboriginals as sort of the um, the reason for it is really just terrible. Well, by terming an invasion day, they're pre they're pretty much saying that the modern Australian state is illegitimate. Like ev everything uh, in Australia, like uh, all, uh, our complete society, shouldn't exist. And they're all and, and they're saying, oh, Aboriginal people would have been better off. If, uh, if 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 Europeans uh, had never come, which which is completely false. I mean, uh, the Europeans brought uh, modern uh, te technology, uh, uh, in in industry, uh, health uh, and medicine. So yes, there like there there was some mistreatment uh, along the way, but overall uh, today. Indigenous Australians uh, are a lot better off and de and, def and definitely uh, have more opportunities than if Europeans had never come. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, can you imagine what life would be like if the, if we had never come? That would have been exactly the, in exactly the same position that 
they were, you know, 500 years ago. That's all. And they, uh, and, and they also, uh, the left and also some elements of the libertarian movement, I might add, uh, make out that before uh, European settlement came to Australia, it was some sort of utopia uh, for, for Indigenous Australians, which is, uh, which is completely untrue. I mean, all this talk about you know, genocide, there were, the Aboriginal Australians were committing genocide against each other all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's the same thing in New Zealand, right? The, the, they used to fight each other. It was all, and as like Australia was not some hotbed of you know utopia. The amount of you know dangerous animals. I think the life expectancy is still very low, but it would have been probably about twenty-five to thirty for Aboriginals back in those times. They had no infrastructure. They had no you know running water. They had no you know, sewage. There's no sanitation. No innocent until proven guilty, no equality before the law, no court systems. I mean, all these things the average doesn't have. They had like boomerang. I mean, they didn't have that much at all. Right? They, they barely had even um, property uh, fencing right around their properties. So, yeah. Uh, uh, but but the day fit uh, you know the invasion day narrative it fits the it fits the less narrative which is of course you know white people bad uh, you know all all brown people good and also uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, calling it invasion day it's to denigrate you know a day of pride of Western civilization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, the backlash. The good part is is that the backlash you can see the backlash beginning. To, uh, to these type of things, right? Where every time that the left does this and they ruin something that everyone enjoys, the backlash against them will be will be much more severe every single time. So it's not not the worst thing, but it's it's not a good thing. But I can, I can there are positives to it, which is it'll wake more and more people up, and more more and more people will become aware of just how bad bad the left are. Well, I pointed out that poll. Uh you know, only fifteen percent of Australians want the want the date change, but it still just shows the the power the left have over the the media and the and the, and the culture. The fact that you know they can hold this what is basically a massive uh, tantrum in uh, the centre of our major cities. Of course, being the left, you know they blocked roads, uh, you know caused mass inconvenience because it wouldn't be a rally unless you uh, a leftist rally unless you pissed people off. They they yeah. they were able to to dominate the headlines. I mean, there were there was hardly uh, on the news that night. There there was hardly you know any many highlights of you know celebrations of Australia Day. It was all these all these pro- protests everywhere. I mean, they pretty much were able to to hijack the day and turn it into a day of shame rather than celebration. Yeah, and that's very noticeable to anyone with you know a brain and two eyes, right? Anyone, all Australians who celebrated Australia Day and they go turn on the news, say, oh, what did everyone else do on Australia Day? And it's all just lefties having a cry. All it does is show the, um, the contempt the media has for their own country. And it will just turn the people against the media. So the media think, the left think they're winning with this. I think it'll, it'll backfire like everything else they do in their faces and quite, quite considerably as, as we move forward. Well, thankfully, both major parties, both uh, Liberal and Labor, uh, have said they're against uh, ch- changing the date. I mean, mm-hmm. even the the Labor Party, which is uh, uh, which is pr- you know, very far left wing, uh, not that uh, not that similar to the to the Greens. I mean, uh, Bill Shorten, even he knows it's political suicide to to mm-hmm. try and sh- change the date. So. Uh, the media can, you know, uh, talk about this all they want, but uh, thankfully, at least our politicians do do realise that most Australians like Australia Day. Yeah, exactly, and they're not going to change it. I mean, this is just, you know, a few people having a cry. It's never going to get changed. There's, um, and, and and but unless they totally eviscerate the national pride that Australians have for Australia, in the same way they've sort of done it to England, where English people aren't proud of being English. Um, at least some of them aren't anyway. I don't think it'll ever change. No. I don't, th- I don't think it's close to happening anytime soon. Oh, it yeah. depends how, uh, how, how far uh, further left the, the Labour Party drift, I mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, there would be, there, I, I, I predict there would be massive backlash if any party try, uh, tried to change it. Mm. So we might move over to the United States now, where 
it finally happened. Uh, Donald Trump is now uh, president of the of the United States. And the, so there were two sets of protests. There was the, the ones on a, a inauguration day, and then there was the women's march uh, the next day. And of course, probably the uh, the inauguration day protest, what, what, what summed it up uh, uh, pretty much the, the leftist reaction was when he was announced as president and there was that woman uh, on her knees saying, no! Yeah, yeah, um, and that was such a good video. But it happened in uh, in Auckland as well. I don't know if you saw the video um, of me in the Auckland protests, but this um, this fat fucking feminist um, charged at because uh, we went to the um, the Auckland protests, right? I went down to the Auckland protests, and um, we and I was in there giving them a speech and protesting against them and giving them hell, and um, this feminist charged at charged at us and so I had to you know grab her and restrain her and uh, tackled her put her on the ground and then when she got up she started screeching Trump wants to kill people like me about two or three times like really screeching it like if you watch the video it's hilarious um, but yeah it's the same thing I think they're the same thing all over right but um, yeah the the woman who sat there screeching that's all they do now that's they're all they're just adult children having a, 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 a four-year-old tantrum that's all they are and that's all people see as well, at least in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, so in Washington, so they, uh, the uh, some of the protesters, uh, they uh, uh, they destroyed private property and assaulted Trump supporters. And a lot of people pointed out that uh, they destroyed a Starbucks and a Bank of America, which donated money to Hillary's campaign. <laughs> and the limousine they set on fire was owned by a Muslim. <laughs> so, so it shows clearly how mindless uh, the left are when committing all this violence it, 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 they're just in a rage yeah and it's not like they got they got the smartest people to go and riot right smart people don't go right because now all those people that went and rioted now have felonies and can't vote oh, so yes. good job yeah, so they're all being charged with yeah felony writing, which which is awesome. I mean, you know, the reason why they 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 behave like this in the first place is because uh, you know they they haven't been held accountable for their actions. But uh, yeah. they obviously haven't real, realized that you know Trump when he said he was the law and order candidate, he he was serious. Yeah, and they they've been able to get away with it for so long, and for like Bush didn't have the political sort of balls to do it. Clinton would let them do it, and so would Obama, right? Obama for the last eight years has sort of really put the pressure on and, and has actually been encouraging and endorsing these type of actions for the last eight years. So for a lot of these writers, their entire adult lives, they've been able to get away with this, right? Obama famously held Black Lives Matter meetings at the White House, like hundreds of them, right? And so they've, they've never known anything else. And so if you don't know anything else and um, then and everything every single time you've done it you've got away with it the sort of then they weren't used to being punished for it and now they're really going to get punished right now they're going to all get charged with felonies and I don't know how many of them are going to go to jail but um, I don't believe Trump is going to let that slide right and uh, yeah so, though if I hear like one person, you know, either from the left or uh, a libertarian complain that, you know, charging these people is evidence of uh, Trump's fascist America. Are you seriously saying that people being account held accountable for their actions is, you know, fascism? Are you saying that, you know, writing's accept acceptable? I haven't heard anyone say that yet, but I bet someone will. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to defend, like, just willful destruction of property. The only way they, they do it I, is I, they... I, I, I've heard uh, leftists and libertarians defend uh, Black Lives Matter riots. Oh, no, no, the way in which they, um, they defend them is because you can't... It's very politically difficult to defend a riot. What they do is they say that it's protesting, right? And they say they're doing it because they're oppressed. And that's how they defend it. They'll never ever. I don't, I, it's very difficult to to portray destruction, just willful destruction of property, as as a positive thing. The way in which they do it is they just they ignore the violence and they just say it was a peaceful protest, right? You if you hear if you go and read all the news reports of the protests on Trump, you'll never hear that there were just armies of um, Antifa and all these right all these left wing communists at the Trump's inauguration beating people up as they tried to get into his inauguration thing. Right, I think Infowars had a live stream, and um, you could just see people getting beaten up all the time. Alex Jones would try to get into one of these things, and he'd just get the shit kicked out of him. Right, 
And um, there, there was no reporting on that. There was no reporting on how violent they were to anyone. They threw bricks at people. I mean, um, they were shoving people at the uh, deplorable, um, uh, trying to get in. And throwing, uh, they threw bricks at a couple of people. And so they'll, they'll never put that up, right? And so they'll never show the violence that, um, that will happen. They'll just ignore it and hope that by ignoring it, no one will notice, right? And that's how they'll defend it. They won't defend it by saying, we think writing is okay. They'll defend it by omission and just ignore all the violence and just say it was a peaceful protest. And then anyone who's against pe peaceful protests hate freedom, right? And that's how they're going to do it. That's why they're, sh they're saying that, that's why they'll say that, you know, Trump's crackdown on them will be the um, will, is evidence of fascism because if it is a peaceful protest and he goes and cracks down, then they're correct. But the problem is, is that they're not correct or that it's peaceful. It's very violent. And that's how they'll, that's how they'll shape it, I think. I think they'll shape it by omission rather than by, um, by action. It's just a very, because to do it the other way is a very difficult tactic. It's not that easy. Uh, well, we'll talk about uh, Trump's inauguration address, which I thought was, was, was quite good. I mean, he talked about you know, the problems that America faces, and uh, I did like his America First uh, message, which, uh, which was obviously a swipe at you know, the, the globalist, internationalist ideology that, uh, uh, because I, I think there's nothing wrong with saying you know, a country first. I mean, if you're elected president, it's it's your job to look after the people of your country, not uh, the pe uh, the yes. people overseas. Yeah, and surely that's what all presidents are meant to do, right? The, this like people are saying it's racist and all. This. It's like if you're elected the head of a government, your job is to look out for the uh, for the well being of your citizens. Every decision you make is meant to be for the well-being of your citizens. If the fact that America first is sort of revolutionary and patriotic, it's like, no, that's how it's meant to be. Right? There's not, there's, this is nothing radical about saying that the country that I'm elected by should come first, right? The head of, you know, Australia, the, you know, the Prime Minister of Australia, should be looking out for the interests of Australia only, right? All decisions should be made for the interests of Australia. All decisions that New Zealand Prime Ministers do, uh, do should be for the best interests of New Zealand. Right, and their and, the, and the, their best method, right, and their best judgment for the best interest of the country. Anything else is is uh, is the, get, the, by definition against the interests of the country. And if you're willingly going against the interests of the country, that's treason, right? If you're elected official, and you're going against the interests of the country, uh, knowingly, that is that is treason. That's going against the interests of the country. That's what it is. Yeah. If you're if you're the, like I, I always use the example. If you're the the chairman of Manchester United Football Club. It's not part of your job to look after the interests of the Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> exactly. Good. It's a good analogy, actually. I like that. And uh, we'll t uh, of course, the next day was the the women's march, uh, which was uh, 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 the main one was in Washington uh, D.C. But there were, uh, as they called them, sister marches all around the world, including in Sydney, Sydney and Melbourne, and of course the unshackled team were and at here. The, the the Sydney one. Uh, at, uh, at the Washington one, there were uh, women dressed as uh, vaginas. Uh, there they had. Uh, uh, few, uh, quite a number of celebrities, and of course, Madonna said that she wanted to to blow up the White House, which is an incitement to terrorist act in in my mind. But pretty much, it, it was trying to continue the narrative that you know Trump is um, raging misogynist. Mhm. Mm and I mean, this was all planned months ago. This was meant to be the um, Hillary sort of protection squad uh, after Hillary got elected, because this was all George Soros funded, right? This is all hundreds of millions of dollars that Soros and a couple of others had put into this. And this was meant to be Hillary's sort of support, you know, rally um, as they came in. And that's why they were there. Well, that was why it was set up. And then when Trump won, they sort of just sort of changed it a little bit to this women's, to anti-Trump sort of women's march. But um, what's interesting is they, all they did was talk about, you know, vaginas and abortions. And they were like, well, we don't want to be judged by, um, by, for being a woman, but the only thing we're going to use is the fact that, you know, we have a child. The whole thing is mental. Like you talk to them 
and they're like adult children. I don't, I don't know, because there was a couple in, in, um, in Auckland as well, and you talk to a couple of these women, and they literally can't form sen like logical sentences to save their lives. And, um, yeah, it's very interesting um, to talk to a couple of them. They're very mental. Well, they all favour uh, big government. I mean, uh, mm. uh, I, I watched the, all the footy, uh, footage from the, the Sydney one, and, of course, no, they, they, they're not really about female independence. They're all like, they, they basically say we're all helpless. We need, you know, big government to, you know, fund uh, all our health care, have affirmative action. You know, you, you know we, we need the, the government to help us succeed. There's no, uh, you know, we, we can't achieve it through, you know, self-empowerment. Yeah, and it's like if you if you want to be um, if you want to be independent, then surely you'd be against the government funding of abortions because if you want to get an abortion, you'd want to pay for it yourself, right? If you want uh, you know all these sanitary equipment that women have, right? Uh, I saw this fa this very funny sign that said if they have to pay for razors, um, uh, if we have to pay. Um, for tampons, they have to pay for raises, and everyone was like, "But we do pay for raises." It's like, <laughs> but that's the sort of the, the thought process, which is, if they want to be independent and independence is a good thing, then surely you wouldn't want anyone to be paying for anything that you do because you want to be independent, right? So all the abortions, if whether you're for or against abortion, you shouldn't be for forcing people to agree with you, right? I wouldn't, if we agree with, disagree with something, I shouldn't force you to, to agree with me, which is what uh, government funding of abortion is, right? Which is taxpayers who may not agree with your position, you're forcing them to pay for it to agree with you, right? And no matter which sort of side of the discussion uh, that you're on, you shouldn't agree, um, be for the mandating that the government pay for it, right? If you want to get an abortion, you should have to pay for it yourself. The same thing, all the sanitary equipment and... It's like, I have to pay for my own toiletries. Why shouldn't you? I don't know. Is that is that radical? Is that radical? Does that sound radical to you? Yeah. It's, it's odd how yeah, modern feminism is basically that, you know, women, women uh, are, 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 are so oppressed that, you know, they are... You know they can't they get they can't do anything do anything for themselves they need they need someone else to do it it's mm -hmm. it, it, it's quite bizarre and we should mm -hmm. also point out that the organizer of the Washington uh, march she uh, she is an Islamist who supports Sharia law so hardly the uh, uh, the embodiment of uh, female liberation. Yeah, and you had all these women at the at the women's march screaming Allah Akbar. And saying how great Islam is, and this is this was the real. We've not seen the those of us in the sort of politics knew this a couple of years ago, but you really see now the merging of Islam and the left into one sort of cohesive unit, and it's going to be the. I think this will be the beginning of the end of the left because now that they're, they're really now openly merging with Islam to go pure to go full fledged against the West, right? So if you read any ISIS literature. And any you know radical Islamic literature, they always say if you manage to get into the, into the West, you go with the left wing because they they stand for exactly the same things that we stand for. The Paul Joseph Watson video um, of these feminists screaming Allah Akbar and you know embracing Islam. These are not pro women. Islam is not pro women. These these women do not represent uh, women, right? Feminism. I think the the latest British poll, right? There was about seven percent identify as feminists, and thirty only thirty something percent agree with the te tenets of feminism, right? So these don't these women don't speak for the majority of women. These women don't speak for even the, the um, you know, a minority of women. It's a tiny minority of women that they represent, and they're now openly representing the most anti woman and the most hateful ideology on the planet, right? At the moment, which is Islam, right? They if they're endorsing Islam, they're endorsing Sharia law. So they're endorsing the beating of women, the rape of women, the gang rape of women. They're endorsing if women get raped, then you know, um, then they must be punished for being raped, right? They're endorsing that the women's testimony is worth, you know, I think it's a quarter of that of a man. These are all things they're now endorsing. That's what the left believes. Is what feminism has now become, is an advocate of Islam, and that's, I mean, it's it's eye opening for anyone. Um, who isn't aware? Where those of us that uh, have been doing this for a while, we knew this. But for those that aren't aware, 
I think this will be very eye-opening the next sort of few months of feminism as we as we go forward. I've always uh, thought the main thing that binds uh, Isla I I Islamism and feminism together is because both uh, ideologies are anti-female sexuality. I mean, they're all about you know, women, uh, you know, sh uh, shouldn't have uh, you know anything anything to do with men should all, you know, c cover up in public, like really sort of, you know, anti-sex. Anti and so I think that's the main thing that, that binds them together is that they both want to, well, want women to, you know, cover up and, you know, not, not, not have much, much sexual interaction with men. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it should be the end of the left because people are so anti-Islam that the, the merging of the left and Islam, I think, will be one of the beginnings of the end for them. We should talk about the numbers at the uh, inauguration uh, and, the, and the rally the next day. Of course, the media, they showed this picture of Obama's inauguration and, uh, and then Trump's inauguration. Uh, but, but it was revealed that the photo of Trump's inauguration was taken hours before the actual inauguration uh, took yeah. place. Yeah, they took it at 8.30. And so it's like if you go to a concert and you take a picture of the concert an hour before the concert starts, it's like, well, obviously, uh, you know, most of the crowd isn't going to be there, right? But um, what I found interesting was the next day when um, the press secretary started challenging on them, this on them, uh, them on this, they were sort of surprised that the, the White House would challenge the media on the lies that the media told. And I think now this is all the media have is just to make shit up because otherwise you have to focus on what Trump's doing and you have to focus on all the problems that the media has. And so the media, I think now are just going to do more and more hoaxes and they're going to become more and more fake news as we go forward. Because you think about it, if you put out a story of Trump's crowd sizes, you're no longer talking about the you know the millions of illegals that are going to be you know uh, you know uh, they're in the country doing all sorts of damage right you're not talking about real issues anymore because if you talk about real issues you're just going to get slaughtered with facts and reason and evidence right and so now I think instead of going um, with stories and sort of addressing what Trump's saying because they have no credibility they've torched their credibility in trying to prevent Trump getting in they're now going to do more and more fake stories as as much as possible in order for them to remain relevant, because that's the only way they can maintain the conversation or maintain power in the conversation. Uh, but, uh, but of course, if they're, they're called out for their, their fake news, then they all scream, oh, you're oppressing the, the free press. I mean, that's yeah. uh, that's the line they, they, they always come out with. But it's, the, the good thing about oh, the, the new Trump era and the alternative media is that it's so easy for, for these lies to be... To, uh, to, uh, to be exposed. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> I know, it's funny, they, they thought they'd be able to get away with it. They took a picture with uh, with clock tower and, and like a gigapixel camera, and all you had to do was zoom in on the clock tower and you find out what time they took the picture. It's like, do you think you're going to get away with that? It's like, I, I, it's like they're not even trying anymore. It's like they're, they, they're doing it specifically because they know they're going to get debunked. They do it and just to hold the news cycle for another couple of days because otherwise they'll have to talk about real issues and then they'll, then they'll get even more creamed, right? So, uh, uh, And the media, they made a big deal about the, the uh, numbers at the Women's March the next day, but my, my response to that is, so what, Trump still won. He was the one inaugurated <laughs> the previous day. I mean, you don't win elections based on how many people turn up to your rally. Yeah, and what were they expecting? Do they want all 64 million or how many people voted for Trump to turn up? It's like they've actually got shit to do, man. It's like, go away. And the, the, more interestingly is how many people and how much is the media going to cover the pro-life march that's happening? I think it's either today or tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it's happening today, I believe. Y yeah, yeah. As, I, we, as we record as, the show. Um, which is yeah, the 28th at the moment, right? So... Um, how, how much is the media going to cover that? Where you have, I don't know if it's hundreds, of other, millions of people saying that it's bigger than the the, the other march. I've, yeah, I've I checked Twitter before the before the show started, and it's not trending at all. 
No, and how much is the mainstream media going to cover that, right? So if they covered the pro pro choice march and they covered the women's march against Trump, then surely, and they said, well, that get that gets a fair hearing. Well, surely the same sort of crowd size would get the exact same media coverage for the, the for the pro Trump pro life march, right? But that it won't happen, right? We both know it won't happen because the media. As Steve Bannon has said recently, the media is the opposition party, right? The media is the um, is the opposition in the, of the country, and the media is a, is a left wing surrogate. And anything that promotes left wing ideas is what the media will cover. And anything that promote doesn't promote that or goes against their ideology, they won't. Because right? you imagine if all the mainstream news outlets in America or, or New Zealand. Australia said there was millions of people on a pro-life march in uh, in Washington today. You know, more people than um, that were protesting Trump. You know, right? Why would they do that? Right? They they just going to lose out their entire narrative. There's no reason for them to do that, and they won't. So we should talk about now Trump's uh, first week as president. Uh, there, we should talk about a few of the little things that have happened uh, so far. The the White House bathrooms of actor male and female. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we go back to two genders now. Um, yeah, um, the good thing about Trump inauguration, two genders, yeah, only male and female now. We make it the, the big lift. <laughs> And uh, uh, they're all references to climate change have been deleted from the uh, White House website. There's no longer a Spanish option. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, there's obviously been uh, a, a removal of a lot of the, the leftist uh, rubbish that was th that was on there. But let's talk about some some things of substance. Uh, yeah. So he's withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, he's uh, begun to uh, withdraw from the Paris Climate uh, Agreement. There's also a bill in Congress to uh, withdraw uh, fr uh, from the from the UN. So, yep. and also he has uh, also signed an executive order to begin the process of building the wall and shut down sanctuary cities. So, mm -hmm. it's it's been a week of action so far. And not just that, I mean, the um, the first day that General Mattis got in charge of the Department of Defense, the Secretary, Secretary of Defense, he um, hit the head of ISIS and, um, and I think you get a 31, 31 bombs got dropped and they got uh, un, unverified reports, but looks promising that they've killed the head of ISIS already and they've, you know, taken all the infrastructure out. There was the um, the signing of the deportation for uh, for all the illegals in America, um, the, and they're going to uh, they're going to start deporting them, and especially all the criminals, right? All the criminals have been earmarked for deportation, and that's going to be beginning soon. So, uh, very very good and promising things that are about to happen. And what's interesting, I think, is that the way in which Trump's doing it is a very clever tactic. It's sort of it, for in history, what we've known is that a president takes you know three months to do any one of the things that Trump has done. It will normally take an administration many many months to do, right? And so he sort of in you know, sort of throws a tennis ball. If you throw one ball to the media, it's very easy for them to catch it and you know spend you know th you know a week to, you know dismantling everything that Trump is doing. What Trump has done is he's thrown about a thousand tennis balls at them, and they literally can't catch them all. And so what's what's happening is if if he can keep throwing tennis balls and they can't catch them all, then he's going to get a whole bunch of this done without any opposi opposition from the left. But well, they might challenge him on a couple of things, but most of what he's going to what he's doing, a he has a mandate for because everything he's doing, he said in his speeches he was doing, right, and also the repeal of Obamacare, right, that's happening as well. Yeah. Um. Uh. He has a full mandate to do everything that he's doing because everything he, he's doing, he um, he campaigned in his speech for, um, his uh, his election for, and not only that, but the left won't have the capacity to fight him because there's just too much coming at them, and I think this is a very good um, good example to anyone else that comes into power, that's you know, of the new right or the you know sort of the Trump right coming in, is that you just you don't hold back, you just go as hard as you can with as much as you can. And the left will just capitulate, which is what they've done with Trump, because they can't fight him, because there's too much coming at them. They don't know what to do. And I think it's a very, very interesting tactic, and I love it. 
what do you think? Yeah, I, it's interesting. Like the left, they 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 said like after after he was elected president, oh, he's not really going to do all these things. Oh, just you watch. He yeah. you know he he he'll back away. But so far, he's you know it's only been a week, but he's already begun to yeah implement uh, you know all all of his uh, all of his promises. So yeah, he you know he is getting down to business. He's he's doing uh, what what he said he would. He's doing as much as he can, uh, you know, just by signing executive orders because getting things through Congress is is a bit is a bit more difficult. But yeah, he's he's definitely not not mucking mucking around. Yeah, and I think one of the the two most important ones was he's defunding national public radio. And um, I think it's uh, one of the public uh, TV stations. And it's all these hard left-wing media operations that get government funding, all the, the, radio, the public radio and the public TV stations, they're no longer going to get government funding. He's, and he's just no longer. And they're having a serious cry about this. And all this all happen is that the, the left-wing media that are getting government funding are just going to be forced to either make the lefties pay for the, what they're consuming, or they're going to be forced to be more right-wing and include more, alter, more viewpoints in which people wish to pay for, which can only be a good thing, right? And another thing which uh, some people were triggered by was uh, Trump announced a 20% tariff on Mexican imports, which, uh, you know, everyone just calmed down. This is a negotiating position to get uh, to get Mexico to pay for the wall. I mm -hmm. mean, his, his, ca his campaign promise was to make Mexico to pay for the wall. This tariff is designed to... Uh, to make Mexico pay for it. So uh, I think people don't get that. They just want to be triggered by what he does. Yeah, and this is anyone that doesn't, um, that hasn't read any of Trump's books will, are the only ones that are surprised by this. He wrote three books, one of them being the biggest selling business book of all time called The Art of the Deal. He wrote this in two of his other books. One was how, Why I Want to Make You Rich and I can't remember the other one. But yeah, he wrote this in three books where he said, when you go into a negotiation... Never ever show them what you actually want and always have the hardline position as something that they really don't want. And he said if they ever back out of a deal, um, the, 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 it's sort of the carrot and the stick. But the stick has to be a real stick and the carrot has to be a real carrot. And this is the real stick, right? The, the president of Mexico said that I'm not paying for the wall and they cancelled the meeting. And so now this is Trump showing the stick because Trump would have said this to him in private. He said if you don't do this... I'm going to implement a 20% tariff and it's going to cr cripple Mexican imports because it's going to raise the price of Mexican imports by 20% in America, which will mean that the, the price of them will go up, which will mean the cost efficiency of the American made uh, products will go, will go down, right? So people will, will buy, you know, Texas beer over Coronas, right? And, and all the other sort of imports that are coming in from Mexico. And I think 80 percent of 80 something percent of Mexican import uh, Mexican manu uh, exports go to America, so it's not like Mexico can just Mexico hold none of the cards in this negotiation. And so all the libertarians that you know, well, the, the Americans going to pay for it. Sure, the Americans are going to pay for it in the, in the in the in the import tax, but this is not. I don't think this will go through. This is just a, a negotiation position uh, the, that Trump has begun. And it, it will, will, it will, I don't think it will, this will happen at all. I think the Mexican government will capitulate and do whatever Trump says. Yeah. And if uh, libertarians, if they're worried about the high cost of things, they should, they should also realize that Trump wants to cut taxes, cut regulations, uh, uh, ma uh, make it so that energy is uh, cheaper through uh, the removal of environmental and energy regulations, so, uh, which is something I thought they, they wanted as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But we we might have to finish there uh, yeah, for for, good. for today. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, for for being a for being my co-host again today. That's right. It's good fun. I always enjoy it. Yep, so uh, just a few announcements before uh, we finish the. The voting for the Unshack uh, 2016 Unshackler Awards has now closed and we've announced the, the winners. So make sure that you check out our announcement uh, video by uh, Unshackled contributing editor uh, Damien Ferry. 
Uh, just another reminder to sign up to the email list, uh, just in case you know, we get banned from Facebook, which you can do at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, don't forget you can also uh, support the show at theunshackled.net slash support. And also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on your preferred platform, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or the video version on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to keep checking the unshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. We're posting a lot more uh, articles uh, uh, all the time now, so there's always something new on there, so make sure you check it out. So thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.